to our next speaker. So uh, the next speaker is I Agree fellow, Dr. Toby Mottram. Toby began his career as a farm worker in Devon and then retrained as an engineer, moving into research, teaching, and then focusing on digital agri-technology. As a co-inventor of robotic milking systems, much of Toby's work focused around livestock health monitoring systems. Following commercial, commercialization and sale of some of the businesses Toby created from his developments, he has since refocused on sustainable land management and horticulture using robotics and sensing technologies. Recognizing the known challenges agricultural faces, such as climate change and labor shortages, Toby has been developing a horticultural development and test center for robotic systems. In his presentation today, Toby will explore if specialist robots are the future, or can we simply adapt more cost-effective traditional tractor implement-based systems? I'll hand over to Toby. So uh, it's, a, it's a great honour to be asked by I Agree, which I always saw as a club I couldn't really join as a dairy specialist. It was always about tractors. Um, and of course, I saw the light on the road to uh, not Damascus exactly, but Exeter, and uh, and decided, yeah, I'm going to get into this. This is fun. And uh, and uh, my dairy companies uh, moved on. So what I'm going to talk about today is um, uh, it, it's mostly about horticulture, uh, where we've got a whole series of uh, different challenges. And, uh, and, and I'll, I'll start by going through a brief history, because we have to remember in a 50 year career, you can see have seen an awful lot of changes. Then I'm going to talk more about the tractor and I want to talk about autonomy. I, I I really don't think we should be using that word. I don't like the word robot because it's it brings up a fictional robot in people's minds. Then of course we've got the maintenance problems of these systems, and as we've already bumped into this issue, who owns the data? And I would I'll be promoting the concept of the digital tractor rather than a, uh, a, a robot tractor, a digital tractor, which is fully logged and, and everyone knows where it is and what it does. So let's move on. Where's my button to do that? Yeah. So here's me. Um, I milked cows and studied engineering at, at the Open University back in the 1980s. I was very lucky to be recruited by Silso Research Institute to develop robot milking in the late 80s. Uh, and that led on to the very successful Dillaval BMS machine. And this here is my sketch from um, 1989 as to what a robot would look like. And uh, I'm very pleased that actually they pretty much do look like that, although a lot, lot tidier these days. Um, but uh, then once you take the human out of uh, milking uh, cows, you have to do the health management stuff. And it's interesting to now see how we're looking at crops in the field. Um, and so, uh, so I worked on animal health monitoring technologies, rumen telemetry, and uh, an, an inline milk hormone sensing. And I had a company that I'd set up called Milkalyzer, which I sold to Lely Robotics in 2020, just as, of course, as the uh, COVID thing crashed in on us. Um, with the funds, I was able to buy a small field in Devon, and I've installed a polytunnel robot, which is this thing here. Um, there's no crop in there. Uh, when I took the photograph, but now it's been um, cropped several times, everything's in straight lines. And you can restart thinking about, do you actually need to plant rows? Why don't you plant two or three of the lettuce, followed by two or three of carrots and so on? And, and you can completely rethink how you grow crops. Um, I also rent out allotments because I think the community needs more growing space and, uh, and, and it also means I don't have to farm every, every element of the, of the field. But I've just this today got my Innovate UK grant on um, safe hybrid working of robots. So uh, we'll, uh, there'll be more developments in that area. So, yeah, looking through, it's been a long going way back to when I started. We, were, we thought a computer was a big thing in Milton Keynes and we had an acoustic coupler and we did some pretty basic maths on it. But I won't need to go through that. But I did find I, I had to do another degree in the... 20, 20, 2007, just so because software had moved on so much. And, and also when you're running a company, you need to know what, uh, what the programmers are actually up to. Um, so yeah, robot milking, it goes back a long way. That's 1989, we started that project. Um, well, Mike Street started it a year earlier. And that was uh, that's one of the first sort of systems. Now, obviously much slicker 
Um, but in those days, our camera systems and our computers were just not quick enough to deal with imagery. Uh, and obviously that's changed. Uh, de developed telemetry systems for monitoring what was going on inside cows. And that then that started off as coming off a, a laptop. And then the smartphone came along and we had to write everything, rewrite everything in Java. So it's a constantly moving field. And my inline uh, milk analysis of hormones, which is um, uh, done through lateral flow tests. And I used to go around everywhere talking to investors. Yeah, we're going to use a lateral flow test. And it was like, what's that? Well, I think pretty much everybody knows what a lateral flow test is. Uh, and we used a Raspberry Pi. Uh, and this is actually a, a cow being milked and having her progesterone monitored and the data telemetered through to a base station. Now, that was pretty amazing to think how far we've come since back in my SILSO master's degree, I, I've sent data over a telephone wire from 50 miles away, and that was seen as a breakthrough. Now it's just everything is like this. So let's start talking about who is farming. Uh, there's quite a lot of organic growers in Devon. Uh, this is one of our producers down here. And, and uh, from a distance, you'd think, oh, it's just a, an old beat up tractor and someone who's not really with it. But this guy's producing over 100,000 cauliflower heads a year. Very switched on. He has other tractors, but this is his, his, his old reliable one. But they, these guys are very technically capable and it's easy to underestimate their ability to, to move with times. And this guy was 20 years ahead of the time because he's been organic since, since as long as I can remember. And we have to also look how our sector is changing. The, the biggest worry globally is that this decline in soil health and uh, er, er, erosion and pollution uh, and our agrochemicals causing the death of the soil microbiome. And if we lose that, uh, are we actually going to be able to grow crops? If we keep treating uh, soil as a uh, just a medium um, that we throw on nitrogen and so forth, and clearly from the, the pictures that Will's just put on, it's it's non-homogeneous across the field anyway. You 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 will not find the same growth, and that's often because of features from historical times. And also, we have to recognize about 80% of applied fertilizer goes uh, not to the plant, but let's call it pollution. That's what it is. It goes off as nitrous oxide, goes down the rivers as ammonia, and causes all sorts of subsequent problems. So it's actually a waste of money. Um, and and we've, we've looked at marginal cost curves as a way of mm, uh, applying fertilizer, but we also should be looking at the marginal loss to the environment. Another feature that's going on in the background is that processed food is, is now being much more recognized as a health risk. It's based on very few crops, um, uh, palm oil, soya, cereals, and, and, and that makes us vulnerable to, to changes. But also it means that you've got marketing departments that are generating um, addiction in effect to, to a particular things. And I used to think that you know, eat two or three biscuits out of a pack, but now I find it hard to stop myself. Now, that might be just me, but I think there's a design going on into the taste uh, of these pro products. And there's a consumer choices are changing too. There's a, there's a rise in localism. Uh, people would prefer to have things produced locally. Um, a lot of the time they don't care, but uh, when you start looking at the long supply chains, you look at the pollution problems in Murcia and Spain and, and, and the shortage of water in some of the growing areas, these are, these are concerns for the government. But at the same time, government is also moving its subsidy structure towards more biodiversity, which I think we all applaud, but, but the, this will have an impact on how farms are run because you know, you, you're going to make more money out of your subsidies in some places than you are out of farming. So let's look at the effects of this change. Is there's going to be less agrochemical use, there's going to be less spraying and more biological prophylactics, which let's face it is a kind of organic, let's, it's a way of another saying organic farming um, in, in one name or another. We, I don't like the term organic, it's a marketing term and it's been captured by particular non-governmental organizations, but, but it's this whole series of things that we'll do, which is cover crops and weeding and soil conservation is going to be a, a major feature. So um, ploughing and heavy tillage is going to be slowly phased out. 
because it leads to this carbon and nitrogen loss and, and pollution. And it's also very costly and energy dragging huge uh, pieces of equipment through the soil. I mean, I, I suspect there's a little bit of human, human ingenuity has, set, has, has cut in here. I mean, people plowed with horses and oxen for centuries, but they, they inherently don't have the ability to plow, pull a deep plow. And so most of those plows were just turning over the top um, two or three inches, sorry, four a hundred millimeters. And um, uh, that's all really, when we talk about minimum till, that's all we're doing there. But then the tractors came along and went, oh yeah, we can we can plow deeper, you know, plowing is good. We'll do more of it and we'll do more of it. And then we'll leave mole plows and pan busters and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, I think that was just, we, we were carried away with our own ingenuity at times. The other thing that's also changing is that we need digital provenance. Um, if you look at packets of food now, they will often tell you where they've come from, what the variety being grown is, and so on. And there's also a, a need, and I think this is something we, we are very bad at in agriculture and horticulture, is safety monitoring and staff training. In other industries, people log incidents properly. You know, everybody moans about a, a, an accident book, but it's actually a very slow, inefficient but way of monitoring when th things have gone wrong um, and we need to we, we need to be able to do more of that and we can do that through digital means so let's move on to some engineering um I, i'm old enough to have driven one of these when they were weren't new machines then they've been 20 years on the market this is sort of 1945 46 harry ferguson's t20 and what did it have it had a diesel engine although actually some of them were petrol paraffin, but let's not go there. Um, hydraulic uh, three-point linkage, two-wheel drive, and cost in current prices around about £18,000. So here we are. I've just actually signed a deal on one of these for my project that starts uh, soon. Um, it costs £11,000 at current prices. It's a, it's a cheap... Indian built tractor, but it's a Yanmar company. I'm uh, and I'm ass uh, assured by other people in the industry that it's perfectly fine. It does its job, um, and uh, and and it's it's got thing features that will make it easy to digitize. So, for example, it's got hydrostatic transmission. It's got power steering. Uh, it's also got mount points all over the place. Um, it's got two hydraulic outputs. Uh, it's got uh, obviously the same things, but it's also um, as standard four wheel drive. So you've, you've got a lot of features there. And when I see, and I've been to two FIRA meetings where all the latest robots are being shown off, one in France, one in California. And basically a lot of people seem to be trying to reinvent the tractor, which to me seems it's a bit of a thing to do. And we also have to remember what else the tractor does besides, uh, besides being able to drive around. You've got multiple tools. Oops. Uh, Sorry, this is the, this is my very primitive animation here. So you've got multiple tools, and you've obviously got plows, and and, and they will continue to be plowing for a long time to come because it's so built into the to the structures of some cropping systems. But you've also got machines that. Are, driven across fields at 10 15 miles an hour here's a, a three-way mowing system front one either side that's that's something that you have to be able to to do if, you, if you've got a robot i haven't seen one that will do any of that uh you've then got also machines that require data and data connection uh, this is obviously a cedar box and, and these things nowadays are pretty much redundant. If you've got auto steer and auto turn, these are the little um, discs that, that, that mark out your last path. And you've got, um, oops, so, and you've, you've also got a lot of things like hedge trimmers and so forth. So my view is tractors, especially secondhand ones, are going to be around for a very long time to come because you can do 20 different things with them. So I think we need to talk about the digital tractor with um, precision location, auto steer, auto turn, ISO bus features. And to me, 
the, one of the biggest things that's come in through the ISOBUS, uh, which I'm sure that Deere and other companies have had for years, but 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 it's now becoming a, a, a thing that you should be able to bolt onto any tractor, is tractor implement control. So you can actually control the speed of the tractor by the data coming from the, uh, the, the mounted machine. That that's taking a lot of things, and I don't even know what tractor drivers do sitting on one of these tractors. So the machine's controlling pretty much everything. What are they doing? Reading the paper, I suppose. Um, not much else to do. I, I have seen that actually. Uh, one robot milking farmer I saw way back, even 10 or 15 years ago, sitting on his tractor, watching his cows on one screen, watching his carrot prices on the other, and uh, and, and all the machine was doing all the work for him. Um, and I don't, as I said, I don't like the word autonomy because tractors are designed for a particular job to, to be done on, 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 the, uh, on the fields. So let's talk a little bit about position, navigation and timing. Now, within our digital infrastructure, this is all absolutely essential. And I was um, in a meeting for, for as a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, uh, where we're discussing government worries about the reliability of precision, navigation, and timing. And you have to look at the history of it as well. My son-in-law was working for the EU measuring uh, where crops of um, olive groves were, and that was plus or minus two metres because they needed to be able to send an inspector out to make sure that the field was actually being grown and, and, and that was olives and the subsidy should be paid. For the infrastructure crowd, they want sort of around about plus or minus one meter because they want to, to go out and find their manhole cover or their or their lost pump station or whatever. And, and as long as the guys can get to within a meter of it, they'll find it. But when we get down to our requirements, we get to a much higher level of accuracy, something like 10 plus or minus.